Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Lunch and Learn with Our Future Cities. Um, today we're talking about housing and we've got um, an array of really exciting guests today from Block, um, Jakupu, um, as well as Design Space Africa. Um, and I'm going to start by playing a poem by poet Emma Mabie, um, who's written poems for each week of the festival. Um, and we are in week four. The foundation of our house was built on an anthem. The anthem was a prayer our hearts rendered in the language of silence. The rooms reflect our hearts with no light, no warmth. The floors balance the stones our souls carry. Flowers withered by bitter breath. Cold crawls over us and nibbles at our seams. We never knew lack until poverty found residency in our mouths. Despondency has been rattling the door's hinges. Notwithstanding that, tonight we're hosting a dinner to find out how we got here. How we have come to this house, come I see you, to further life or to end it. Who bribed us into deserting our lifeline? We asked all and sundry to come dine with us. A night that stretched for 26 years. We served organic suggestions that night, topped with rhetorical questions. These guests are not here to eat the plight of our life's stories, to hear how we are not living to go to heaven, but not look at every meal as though it's the last supper. We all keep glancing at equality with faint smiles trying to ignore how we became victimized by the spoils of a struggle. No one often reminds the ones oppressed how tyrannical giants fall. So when fortune favors them, greed has them inflating, bursting beyond their bellies. Illusions of democracy attempt to open my mouth, but reality has this tongue feeling like a severed limb. There are gaps in this conversation of intellectual liberation that have our voices shifting as tectonic plates. Until Father Time uttered his only words that evening, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Abruptly, labor shattered to capitalism. This forged long run romance between us and progress is no longer glue that keeps this house together. You have redefined moral hazards, dealt a hand to hedge everything but the people. With a smug, capitalism retorted, don't feed on what you can't fund. The futurist put on his contact lens to comment. This house is on fire. All present are flooding it with emptiness, drenching every space with blood clots to save its foundation. Tip the scales. Sorrow has assaulted your lungs for far too long. Deflate into a readiness to flow. Teach the mind so the heart may preserve its lessons. Our minds are gifts. Earth acknowledges our presence. And so the next day, we spring cleaned. Dusted off distrust, washed the years of betrayal off the walls, washed inequality off our skin, watched injustice flow out the baths and see it drain stagnation's throat. To hear our own esophagus emphasize the echo of victories, our stomachs are yet to clasp. Soak ourselves in knowledge from Urban Festival 2020, embracing our best ideals which await in plenty. We will refurnish every room with lived experience, embedded in the sight of memory, not yet sung of us. Hello everyone again, I hope you can all hear me. Welcome to our fourth Lunch and Learn. 
Um, even though it's called housing, it's actually about areas, neighborhoods, precincts and communities, and housing often forms the center of that. Uh, I'm Rashik Fattah, the founder and director of Our Future Cities. Um, I'll just remind everyone of, of the purpose of our Lunch and Learn. So we started this both as an internal process and as an external process to reflect on past work, to get back in touch with people we've worked with. Um, in the previous weeks, we spoke to colleagues in Lagos, in Cape Town. We got to reconnect with people who we did a great project with, but um, didn't follow up. Hello, Alfredo and Rada and Khalid. We've got um, people popping in. Um, but at the same time, Lunch and Learn is very informal, which stresses some people out. Um, our panelists can hop in and out as their work day requires. They can leave, they can cook, they can chat to someone else in the background. Um, this is not a panel discussion. Um, it's to reflect on what we do, probably to feed into our new website, which was meant to be this year, but because of the pandemic will be next year. Um, and to, yeah, to re-energize and, and talk about the things we love. Um, but we only have an hour, so I'll get started and share my screen to just sort of touch base on the on the kinds of works we do, kind of work we do. Um, let me try and play. So, yeah, we see um, this as being more than a discussion about housing, building housing, housing policy. One of the five areas in which we work which is called co-creating innovative future focused areas, precincts and communities. It's so long winded because this kind of work is quite complex and, and difficult. And when we are commissioned and when we do work on projects and partner, it's a whole bunch of pieces that come together. Some are big projects with very little involvement of us. Some are small projects where we have quite a lot of involvement and, um, uh, but the goal always remains to to innovate, to be a bit future focused in terms of how people would live and share space. Um, on the services page of our website, those are, not, those are not really five departments. They are five areas. So public space links with mobility, mobility links with smaller <laughs> cities. Um, we don't really have a, uh, sectors in terms of you know, infrastructure and then a sector just in policy. Everything in cities really sort of merge together. This is the only formal part of today. I will read through the kinds of work that we do. Um, sometimes we'll get involved very early in the vision for a project and or the urban strategy for a particular area. And that could be down to, you know, which part do you start with first? Um, why you should start with this particular phase? Um, in some cases, it's just a workshop on the, the bigger vision for the project, bringing together different people. And in particular, taking into account the local context and mega trends of the future. Um, even for example, in Cape Town's spatial development framework, which we commented on, I think three or four years ago, there was no mention of mega trends or the fact that people might work from home in the future. So all the modeling done for that vision or plan for the city was based on today only. It didn't take into account mobility changes or how people might work in different locations. So we, we get involved in that level. We identify challenges and opportunities, both in terms of um, uh, a bigger city scale, and we try to bring in a bit of, um, a bit of foresight. Um, we manage collaboration. Sometimes it's not that uh, well, uh, well run. It's, it's more of a messy process to bring people together. Oh. Um, we oversee what I love is design and planning competitions and charrettes, inviting national firms and international firms to enter competitions or, or run some charrettes. Um, sometimes we'll look at placemaking for a large area, so not just one particular square. Uh, and then lots of, <laughs> on the website it says detailed stakeholder engagement. It probably just means complex stakeholder engagement with government, other landlords, um, community groups. <laughs> tenants and local authorities. So um, the engagement is not just community participation, but uh, talking to almost everyone, adjacent buildings, government departments. Uh, and then also really fun is um, uh, 
we've got Lebo and some of my other colleagues in the call uh, developing a branding strategy and communication. I think people do forget that even if you're doing something really cool and really innovative, you need to speak to lay people about it. You need to convince others that whether it's um, densifying, whether it's a new kind of development, whether it's a, a cool high tech space, you need to communicate what that is and, uh, and, and develop a brand that brings people along with, with that journey. So I just wanted to share another um, quick slide and that relates to um, some of the work, if I can find it. Um, just give me one second. I think this slide encapsulates um, a process we had been on uh, for about five years, um, where it was really difficult to understand why with so many NGOs and think tanks in the housing space, why more hadn't been achieved to actually deliver um, deliver housing units, whether it be uh, in informal, semi-formal, formal context. In, in all ways, um, Cape Town and South African cities had been failing to deliver units, um, whether it's inclusionary or affordable, or it really didn't matter. Some, something was kind of stuck and um, and we, when we started to map the process, um, we realized that um, in some cases, uh, everyone thought it was just about community engagement. In some cases, people thought it was only about government not having money. And what we saw from this very bad mapping process, or this not so great graphic, was that there were so many, everyone wanted these integrated neighborhoods and diverse housing options. Um, but an affordable housing, of course, if I can annotate, let me figure out how to annotate. Um, and of course, affordable housing in all its, uh, in all its ways, both uh, inclusionary, transitional housing for those who are displaced, um, um, social housing that we all kind of saw um, this, uh, Okay, my annotations don't want to work. Give me a second. But over here, um, if you see affordable housing, it, it's quite an integral part of, of the vision to build these, you know, it's these diverse inclusive neighborhoods with good transport and public space, but we hadn't, well, we, um, community groups, NGOs, think tanks, developers, we, we hadn't sought to say what really are the blockages. And um, I know Luanda is also popping in, but with Alfredo and Khalid, we were running dialogues back to 2014. And this, this graphic came about in 2018, which, which was sort of a bit of our thinking that you are wrapped in an economy, if you look at the top left, and then you wrapped in a bunch of um, sectors and groups which we thought to be disparate but you know something that weren't being spoken about was even when you built the affordable housing on the top right south africa didn't have a management agency to even manage units which are not technically social housing or technically um uh, rdp housing there was no agency to even allocate rental or um uh, units for purchase two various groups in a lottery system. Let's say you get one extra ticket if you're a single mom with a, a single parent with a kid. Um, the banks weren't offering people better loans um, uh, if you live closer to your job. So if you live 40 kilometers away, you get the same sort of uh, bond from your bank, even if you live adjacent to your place of employment. SARS offered no tax incentives for affordable housing. So you still had to pay VAT, even if you were a developer building inclusionary housing. Um, Neighborhoods were messy and complex. You had formal neighborhood associations, you had sort of rebel groups, you had housing activists, you had religious groups. Um, government was wrapped in layers of policy. I think the city of Cape Town still hasn't released the inclusionary housing policy. And then you kind of hope between government and developer there's a culture of innovation and progress. Um, but possibly government should have been delivering housing. You probably need some sort of super urban development agency. So this is just trying to show that 
somehow we had all missed each other in thinking it was all about who could design nice housing and build it. And, in, in, and we needed to almost mature the dialogue, especially in the NGO sector, to another level to say, look, there's a lot of things and parts that we could all tackle together and not just get stuck in the anti-development or, you know, like with, with some of the projects that some friends have worked on, it's all about zoning and rezoning and getting sites compliant. And if we can just do that, but there's all these parts that need to come together that, um, that deliver these, these future focused, inclusive and vibrant neighborhoods. So I, I'm, I will sort of jump straight to, to Rala, who we worked with um, on the 80, 20 housing, housing model um, from the urban homes developer block. Um, <laughs> and maybe I should, Bring that screen back up, Rada. Rada, thanks for giving us uh, five minutes of your time today. But wow. maybe just share some emotions about that uh, the graphic I had up earlier, and 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 why in this in this maze, our future cities was was a useful partner for some of it. Hopefully, useful. Yeah, I think there's a really challenging landscape that exists within the different layers of the market. Layer one, as you mentioned, is there's a certain stigma that is automatically, um, that automatically exists to a developer, you know, based on the fact that that is what we do. So we're, we're obviously seen in a certain lens. And in this instance, we were able to, through our future cities, engage with certain stakeholders that may not have been as willing to hear us out um, had we not had that consultant layer with us. And through our relationship with our future cities, we were able to engage with, I think we worked out it was about 80 plus hours that Rashik and I spent together. That's um, excluding the, the research team that he had as well, engaging with multiple different stakeholders that sit in a policy lens at the city. It's with neighbor communities. It's with the banks. It is, you know, we were trying to understand this complexity of relationship that exists in the project because you know, there is a principle that you can, you, you know, you can look at the papers that exist on what global best practice is and you can try and implement that here. But as much as we wanted that to exist, there were so many layers of obstacles that existed that um, unfortunately we didn't, <laughs> we weren't successful in getting the 80-20 model approved because it was, rejected by the community and the policymakers, and there wasn't an affordable housing um, yeah. institute that existed that would be able to manage what we did and most of the people that we did engage with in the beginning were wanting to be the people sitting with the popcorn watching you fail to like learn about it because they didn't want to be the person doing something that was unsuccessful and i mean this project was 11 houses that we were trying to do so we weren't trying to provide thousands of homes. We were trying to say, could this be a way in which we could change the policy to encourage and enforce developers to deliver housing at a rate that is more um, consumable by a large majority of the market without it being an onerous or unprofitable venture? Because at the end of the day, you know, the housing is going to fail and it fails everywhere globally if we're part of capitalism because it's led by demand and supply. So until we figure out how to intervene in a way that makes some semblance of sense, you know, we, I think what Rashik and I constantly were saying to the multiple policymakers who told us that it was too complicated a model for them to try and understand. So rather don't try, or well, the other they, option, they said things the other like, option was to wait, wait for the policy. Yeah, wait for the policy. <laughs> so they were saying how, you know, they're busy working on like the urban corridor policies. When they're we still have waiting multiple for the existing, we have existing <laughs> corridors that are being regenerated and invested in by different conglomerates, both public and private sector. Um, and I think for me, what was quite, you know, it was an emotionally draining process because this was, it's like trying to plan this child and you're, you're trying as a developer to do things that you know with every fiber of you could eventually make a difference. But it was 11 houses. I, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it, 
you just wanted to try and we definitely were going to fail on multiple avenues of it. The one thing that was fantastic that came out of it is we went from being attacked from the community to still definitely being hated by a large majority of the community. But another part of the community actually ended up went from attacking us to becoming our co-workers on the project to they ended up painting, they landscaped, they did security management on site when they, they when there was a realization that part of urbanization is inevitable in a capitalist world, unfortunately, that they can actually play a role to improve their well-being. Hmm. And there was this ongoing fight because there always has been this tension and the tension is never going to disappear. But there is a way for us to start working together. And that's where our future cities hmm. was able to help that narrative in a way that people were able to give us the time to hear what we were wanting to do to the effect that I've now had to write letter of recommendations for these same individuals that are now looking for future work based on the experience we had with them and ask me about 2017, 2018, if I ever thought I'd be writing those letters to those same people who were threatening yeah. our company. So it's a really complex, hmm. um, housing is incredibly complex. It's, it's not, it's not as easy too, to navigate. Yeah. yeah, it's but well, that's what I'm saying. When I think about cities, and you know, we're talking about we're wanting to provide housing that was in an area that was by the economic, social, cultural, religious opportunities for the families and their well-being. And then, as Rashik said, the thing that frustrated us the most is what happens if someone works next door to where they live. Banks have this thirty percent of what your your earning is what you can afford to pay towards a bond. But that's not accounting to whether or not the vast majority of your um, salary is being spent on mm. on travel. I think Francois Verrouli always says, you know, it's the like your whole life is 40, 40, 40. You're spending like 40 percent of your time traveling to get to where you need to be. You're yeah. spending all of your salary to get there and you're living in a 40 by 40 home. I'm someone who actually I'm like, what do you do with your space? We don't all need to be in huge homes. I'm I'm very pro compact and micro living if it means you're at the opportunities that enable you to engage sustainably in the economy but yeah. the challenges that exist just to get people to hear you um are very yeah. very real and given that all of us here are human at the end of the day it's very emotionally taxing too and not just in cape town like navigating in in other cities we've worked in as well like finding the right person you can get like this, like city managers support for something, but then you end up dealing with each department having its own policy ring. Um, thanks, Rala. Uh, I will we'll come back to you, so don't leave. Uh, I, I'm going to throw you in the deep end. <laughs> um, uh, we work together on various things, but for the City Lift Forter Freeway Project, I don't think people realize when they look at our City Lift Project, it's actually 75% residential. Um, and Alfredo also worked with us, uh, as well as DHK and a whole bunch of other crazies. I think Francois as well, Francois Verudi. Um, but I think at the time, we, I feel like we know much more now. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's wrong, but uh, at the time, 75% residential meant like 700,000 square meters of bulk over 30 years. Um, I think at the time there was maybe we were still at the beginning, right? I mean, now you're working, you're now you're delivering Conradi. Maybe yeah. just take us through a bit of the gap between then and now. And, and okay, yeah. thanks. Hello, hello, everybody. And uh, that's a giant you. question. And uh, Alfredo, nice to see you as well. So, so, so the um, yes, uh, we learned a lot, you know. And 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 and, and, and when we started, I remember the, the huge debates that we had around. <laughs> what affordable housing actually means you know uh, yeah because now, and in fact i'm not even sure that uh, that uh, that is a common definition for affordable housing uh, Khalid, uh, i did take your work on that to the block project so we yeah. your breakdown in definition which was the yeah. first time anyone actually did a bit of a nuance we then yeah. pulled that into I'm pretty so sure we, it was in there, yeah. I'm pretty sure we, <laughs> so we, sure so we, 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 we steal your work. <laughs> steal, stole, English, stole yeah. your work. Yeah. And uh, then it, took it to another like, project. It's unlikely to be my own words uh, in any <laughs> case. We all learn from each other. Right? And I probably learned from others in any case. So, so the, 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 the getting the definition right um, so is it's, it's key because uh, uh, even today, you know, even with the Kondadi project, there's still a 
there's still a lot of um, misconception as to what affordable housing is. Um, and, uh, you know, as Rala says, the, 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 the housing environment is so complex, just getting to understand that you're talking the same language is, um, is, uh, is big. So, so, so what we've learned, uh, certainly uh, uh, beyond um, uh, the 4 sure 3 way is that uh, housing isn't the only complexity that we have to deal with. So, so the complexity is everywhere uh, in terms of negotiating with, uh, with cities, or with officials, uh, negotiating with, um, with people, uh, you know, um, uh, people who live in the environment or, or affected parties and the like. Complexity is the one thing that we've had to learn how to manage. Um, and and, and uh, uh, I honestly believe that um, design is the best tool to manage it. With. So, so, so design as a tool to negotiate the through the complexities is something that we've now uh, since built into our methodology. So, um, so design as a tool to negotiate and, and a tool to kind of um, uh, decipher and discriminate between the hierarchy of decisions that needs to go through. And we found that, um, you know, the drawing, particularly around housing, right, that we draw collectively um, uh, with officials um, has also been a very, very uh, useful tool. Mm. So, 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 yes, so, so, so first of all, the issue around definitions. And uh, so we've, we've certainly explained what we do, what we understand each of the, you know, what social housing means, what first mm. housing means, what affordable housing means, what um, um, uh, sites and services means. And there's other myriad of other yeah. uh, 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 terms that get used in the ladder of accessing housing. The other thing that I've obviously learned also is that um, 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 uh, we currently can't deliver uh, the housing that the demand for housing. And, and you know what, what the demand is, is all over the place, right? 400,000, 500,000, some people talk about 250,000. Uh, what the demand, to pin down the demand is, is, um, is all over the place. But what we do now is what we deliver. And uh, in Cape Town, we deliver uh, between 6,000 to 10,000 um, subsidized housing opportunities a year. Um, so, uh, but that, but but also what you also understand is the demand is growing. So, so 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 our ability to deliver and the demand are, are two completely different um, trajectories. So the demand is 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 increasing and outstripping supply. So that acknowledgement that we can't solve the problem only by um, by by building ourselves is a lesson that we've learned as well, right? And that we have to find different ways of delivering, right? And, and, and key to this is, is to understand that an informal, informal uh, home uh, shack is also contributing to, uh, to uh, the supply. It's clearly not up to scratch. If it is, con if it is imagined to be the final solution, if it's, if it's a starter for somebody getting somewhere, um, um, uh, then maybe then maybe it is the leg up that is required. Mm. So 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 a big lesson that we've learned is delivery needs to happen through many different ways, you know, many different levels, including by people themselves. Uh, and that we need to find a mechanism to recognize and um, mm. uh, you know, give give rights to people who who have uh, you know, build their own home. Yeah. Uh, and that we have to find ways of, of, of working the bigger system and trying to deliver. I mean, even our 9,000, our, our, what is the 9,000? If you think of that as the uh, yeah. 9,000 units over 30 years, you, you say, I mean, we, we wouldn't be scratching. Uh, we wouldn't be yeah, scratching. Not making, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, the, so we need to do everything. We need to do we need to tackle the problem from all angles, you know, working from, from uh, delivering the 9,000 in, in great locations like in the CBD, but also to uh, support the micro developers working in townships, the informal builders uh, building their own, 
their own homes. Uh, we, we know, for example, that the better, the better living challenge has mm -hmm. uh, developed a set of tools to help uh, shack contractors or builders to do it better. Yeah. You know? So we kind of improve the, how we improve incrementally people's um, uh, uh, access to better quality housing. But Khalid, even, even knowledge exchange between non-micro developers and micro developers, you know, like yeah. just some, some tricks and tips in exchange could be such a, a big improvement. So, 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 so I, I mean, so the other lesson that we always learn is, learn is that um, we, we, need to, we need to definitely do things differently. And we can't rely on government to, to drive the processes. But so, so, so policies, in my view, is often a, a, it hamstrings um, uh, the, the, the delivery process. Um, and, and you guys, uh, uh, Rales, uh, kind of also talks about, you know, uh, wait for the policy. So people, so, so officials can only act within a framework of the rules, right? And the rules, the rules that they establish are certainly not the rules for, let's say, a, a third of our city. Um, so, the, so, the, so the engagement of those rules need to be thought through differently. Uh, so how we plan, you know, planning, uh, so, so uh, uh, um, I, I still have clients who ask for master plans. Um, in other words, for, for large properties, we know all the answers for every eventuality for delivering a project over the next, you know, 15, 20 years is, 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 is unrealistic and, 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 and uh, impossible, in fact. The yeah. time changes, so, so the time, time is, is seldom uh, kind of built into the method of thinking through a plan. So time changes, policies changes, politicians changes, uh, economy changes, the demographics of who requires the products changes. Everything is in flux. So we actually need, a, in my view, a system of thinking through the housing problem in particular in a, in a different uh, uh, method, a different method of delivery. <clears throat> Alfredo, and I, I think mean, when you, oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it, go for it, Rola. No, you I go. think just when you also talk about delivery, there's also like the, the after effects of delivery that so much of the market or the policymakers aren't considering. So yeah. again, in the 80-20 model, something that like we were adamant to learn about was how are these units going to be operated and lived in post us developing it? because you can drop off this miraculous 6,000 units or whatever it is. But if the way in which our city is forcing people who are renting or owning to, to fit into their prescribed system, um, that in itself isn't often sustainable. I mean, we saw it with when housing was initially delivered post 1994 and people were given homes, the process yeah. of getting ownership, the legal costs involved, the monthly rates and levies and all, those costs are, are significant and that impacts your ability in terms of what you can afford. And people aren't even looking at affordability in that lens, which is why we were constantly then pushing towards some form of like social housing institute or some organization that at the time wasn't willing to manage it or didn't exist in the way in which we needed it to exist. But without that, the home ownership in itself isn't plausible. I mean, we've seen it where people gave up their homes and then instead built quarters in the back of the home because it actually wasn't financially viable for them to incur those monthly costs that live in yeah. it. So it's when the city is looking at it and you're looking at it at delivery, it's also, it's, it's the long-term sustainability of that delivery. Like, are you getting people into a home that they can be part of an ecosystem long-term or is it a way of, delivering something that you think is serving a purpose, but you're not actually attacking the cause. You're, you're, it's like the symptom that you're kind of just, oh, here's houses, will fix X. Um, so yeah, I echo just a lot, of your, a lot of the feedback you've given in terms of the layers and the learning and the language. And, you know, it's, it's very complex. <laughs> <laughs> Alfredo, in some ways you didn't wait I mean, you, you built relationships with Ikai Lami and, and the community with, well, the Empower Shack, but all your projects. And, and you, you went from, you know, pathway to compliance in a way um, and actually built, which, you know, what upsets people the most is that you do things. <laughs> and you actually built, you know, 
some homes and and demonstrated um how how I tell you that um is that I'm, is that what you is that what you do with all the projects because it's it's oh. you know it's, it's not really about housing is it it's it's well um it's about how do you affect real change right because yeah. As you, um, you were saying that we can't wait around for the policy to make a, you know, to do what, to do, to change the way cities are, are perceived. But I, I think uh, Kali was very, very uh, precise in saying we need to change the way housing's delivered. We need to figure out how time builds, right? How, how do we build over time? How, how does the city uh, allow that? Because it's only in the 20th century that cities changed into this kind of, um, you know, delivery system that was completely commercialized, institutionalized, yeah. the new thing, right? From the, from, you know, 5,000 years ago, from Fez to now, to, to, to the 19th century, housing in cities were built incrementally over time. So, so, so w this shift that we, that we were so progressive at the beginning of the 20th century, the delivery of mass housing actually came from Russia. So that's pretty funny, right? You know, it came out of the Russian Revolution. They decided housing was the thing. And then it moved on to, uh, to parts of Europe that adopted some of the avant-garde ideals of mass housing, right? And then you get the whole the Frankfurt kitchen, then they start innovating in the sizes of the units, and then they start innovating in the typologies, and you get Le Corbusier in the 50s, 60s, who's doing the duplex apartments in the Marseille block, and so that's how far we got to, right, in terms of this functionalist approach to housing. Now, what everyone forgets is that it's different moments along that development. There has been ideas about integrated cooperative development housing. So, because it's not the apartment unit that's the problem, as Rala was saying, it's how do you pay for all of the additional costs? Like, how do you finance the bank? How does the bank believe that you've got enough income to then loan you or micro loan you, et cetera? So we have to think about affordable housing integrated with some kind of work-life income generation. Um, so we had in the past, and there are examples of that, where the shop owner on the first floor has his apartment above, and somehow the shop helps pay for the incremental you know, uh, mortgage. So how do we return that the subsidized housing has also a component of looking at the whole integrated lifestyle of that individual, right? That's, that's important. But um, the other thing is maybe we have to look at new forms of ownership, of course, um, because we have co-op and we have cooperative developments and we have also condo developments and, you know, um, and, you know um, and freehold or whatever they call it in South Africa, no? And um, I think yeah. where we have to push the government in South Africa is this idea of, of um, of being able to develop subsidized housing um, that on one earth, which is the famous, um, uh, um, what is it, 70? 70 square meters is the RDP. What's an RDP? X72, I think. It's uh, 40, it's, uh, the house is 40, 42 square meters. The house and is 42. The earth, yeah, the earth can be there's no, I don't think there's any particular standard which we can. Uh, right. So we've understand. got to move that 48 square house into sectional title because they're already doing back shacking. So we need that whole policy change. So the 70 earth, if, if those, if maybe, maybe allowing people and training them to build their own houses, maybe. And yeah. so the government had, can get rid of the, the building of the 48 square and just hand over maybe uh, zoned property, you know, like land titles or something, um, or rezone all the informal settlement, Google map, map it all out in Cape Town and say, that's it. Everyone who we can identify with a number and we can, we can, uh, we can do a uh, enumeration of every dwelling that's occupied now in the vicinity of Cape Town and saying we freeze it and, and then we legalize it 
in some way, right? Hernando de Soto's ideas. So, but these are bold moves. No one has the ability to do it. So what do I think? I think we need, like, what did we do in Empower Share? I mean, I remember Heinrich Wolf telling me, uh, you'll never do it. There's no way you're going to walk into Kailicha, BT South, and you're going to take an informal a community of 70 houses of 300 people, and you're going to re-block them in new housing. You're never going to get that through government. Well, you know, land titles, this, that. So we just forego, we just forgot the issue of land titles. Why? They already own it. It's de facto rights. You know, what are we talking about? You're, you're not moving them. There'll be a riot if you move 300 people from BT South, right? So we started to work with the community. We, de, um, we de facto declared the whole parcel of municipal land a cooperative, owned collectively. So if you, if, if all the, uh, oh, there's Sorry, our, trying to share some computer. of it. Yeah, we use this computing model with algorithms to put, to, to be able to, yeah, you, now it's running the plot with, we, we, we showed the government and with the community how we could configure houses and block uh, and earths in different ways. We have this program now that you can agent based and you can plug in all the factors you need, sizes of units, earth sizes, density, and it will model out different solutions. Um, and you can manipulate all of those color coded apartments um, into row houses like Amsterdam, like London, like New York, like Brooklyn, you know, row houses are the most effective way to organize housing. So I'm a big believer that we just do it. And there you, and we started the, we got the community together. We uh, trained them of how to build these row houses. And it, and you know, they're, they're, they're not perfect as Rashika clearly, but look, they're being built by Notombi right there, a resident. She's building her own house. This is an incredible feat. I believe it, it was, uh, and these are the little courtyards before you get in as they were being finished, but we were able to deliver new homes at $9,000, 60 square meters at $9,000. So on two floors, so 30 and 30, right? On average. Um, so that's, that's that story. We can move on. We did it as a demonstration process. Sure, the city, uh, threatened us, they, we had to knock it down, we were not allowed, um, but we found a champion, one champion inside the city council um, who championed it and just said, go for it, go for it. I'll assume the responsibility of the, of the project. And, uh, and now it's built, there's no, um, there's, there's no land titling, we got Bauman's, I don't know, maybe you guys know the legal office called yeah. Bauman's. Uh, they came on board free of charge to figure out how they can work out a document where the city can uh, to hand over the land titles. But until that happens, people are living in the houses. So, you know, they're not worried because they can still sell it as a kind of free, uh, as a kind of um, in informal markets, right? They, they've had numerous offers to buy the units by other informal dwellers who, who just will pay for it, you know? So there's all this black market, let's say, trade of houses, which is already going on. Let's be yeah. sincere. So, if, so my point is, let's do more experiments like this. I think block has to create block affordability or something, uh, you know, a subdivision for experimentation. And what do we have to do? Let's work with all those informal developers. I've identified a couple of them who, who, are, who are making these micro um, developments. And you can see it in Danoon. You can see it all over, right? Wolf has talked about that at other moments. Khalid, you have your examples, maybe near District 6 and all that, right? Um, where we just have to identify three or four guys and do small incremental developments and become the champions of finding, figuring out informal ways to finance these developers and we can help them in the solutions and the only way we can demonstrate to to the government is either you jump on board or we're going to do it ourselves right um 
you know, I'm, what I mean, do it ourselves, I mean, all four of us, uh, Rashik, Rala, Block, Khalid, and myself, we should form a little company in some way, NGO, call it Block Affordability, we're on the board. And, uh, and we start to do these things until the government wakes up. And we've done, and if we end up building enough units, they will react. And someone, I mean, it'll be institutionalized. I believe it, it, I, that's, we've got to drag the government with us in these gray areas. That's my one idea. But the other idea is, what, that's leading me towards the next one. Block was, and I had a lecture at Block many years ago, Rashik, and maybe you remember. I yeah. don't know if Rala was there or in the company. I, wa I was there. I've, I've been there since day one for all my sins. Okay. <laughs> I loved it. I loved working with Block. We had dinner numerous times with your partners there. And, um, and it was very interesting because you guys are so, you know, you want to do it. You want to make change. I think the problem in the Bokap, and I know that project, I, I think that's the one you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Right? of building those 11 units. Um, I think the problem there was that you've got luxury housing, you're selling market rate, and you called these 11 units affordable units, but probably, and I'm not sure, Rally, you tell me, probably they were only like 10%, 20% below market rate. How, it was 50 or, to 60% below market rate, and we it, didn't call them affordable, we called them inclusionary, because we know that it wasn't affordable. Yeah. Okay, so, and then I don't know what kind of a scheme where you put those units on the ground floor because, you, you know, the higher you went, the more, the more valuable that is, right? Or did you separate them in some way in your building? We block? actually, no, so we put them on the ground, the first ground floor, um, few floors, which just as a, it was always a plus of the site, are magnificent units. I mean, Rashik actually lives in one of those units that were meant to be a... <laughs> A, a market unit, but it was because you could split the operational costs of the building that way. So you weren't then participating in the lift costs and all of that. So from your monthly levies, the way in which the building was going to be managed, you were also almost paying a subsidized monthly operational cost towards the building. So we had to look at it in one of two ways. It's either you have to then participate in all the costs of living in a building, which are pretty expensive um, to begin with, you know, the security, the concierge, all those costs, or by being placed there specifically, we were actually able to more than half what your levies would be as well. So we weren't only looking at it from a um, position in the building. It's like, what is the functional affordability of living in a scheme? So you still got the benefit of the communal spaces, which was the roof deck and pool, the gym and the laundry service in the building, which was fantastic, without having to pay for the contribution towards having the lifts, the um, security and the concierge, which is if anyone who lives in a sectional title scheme is where all of your costs go towards. So your, your security in itself for a C grade security guard of 24 hours, you're paying over 60,000 Rand towards that. So this is the example of the unit. This was an inclusionary unit that is now Rashik's current home, which is magnificent. There you can see what your view is. That's your little stoop. It was like an integration and like kind of trying to recreate the, like the stoop levels that exist in Burkhop. Um, to also, I mean, Rashik sends me videos in the morning of like kids skateboarding down the road. So we were trying to make sure that there was still like an interface or this like permeability with the street that already exists. I fully understand that the landscape is incredibly complex in. Uh, hi, Leander. Sorry, just saying hi. But to when the city, um, the response to our development was, we love this, but why don't you build this in Camps Bay? That is literally in my, the, the city's response. The city gave me a NIMBY response. So the city couldn't even, because I mean, the piece of land in itself was a vacant piece of land. So I'm not even going to get into the complexities of that because that, that, that actually takes away from the, the conversation at hand. It was, you know, we, we, we knew there were many learnings we could get from trying something new. Um, but we try to narrow it down to five for this project. And one of them was, you know, the longevity of the project post our involvement, which included the operational costs. And for us in this project, whether it was right or wrong, we were like, we would rather have people that can actually continue to live in the building based on the cost of living than 
try the multifaceted everyone being on all different floors because then we couldn't do that anymore and then to a degree those people are subsidizing the people in the market who can very much afford to pay those costs so yeah, no, thanks thanks rala um i need to step out now unfortunately so step step on you. step off <laughs> Leanna, Thank thanks you. for joining us we have about nine minutes left um really great that you can join us and see your friends Khalid and Alfredo as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, we were speaking about uh, not just housing, but integrated communities and, and some, of the, some of the barriers as well. Um, like, like Alfredo and Khalid, you actually build housing and you have just finished a project um, this year as well and you're working on new projects. Um, when I think back to this first lecture we had five years ago with Alfredo, can you believe it, it's five years? Um, What's been the learning between the, the last project? I think it was Pelican Park that you delivered. What are some one or two, we have, sorry, we only have nine minutes left, but what are, what are one or two of the learnings that, that let's say we thought about then, but now you've actually delivered and worked with in, a, in, a, in another real project? Thanks, thanks, Rashid, and apologies. Uh, I have to juggle a lot of commitments right now. Um, I couldn't join earlier. And, and thanks for being part of such an interesting and uh, very insightful panel. You know, when, 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 um, is it Carla was speaking? Just before now? What's her name? Yeah, it's Rala, yeah. Rala, uh, yes. Um, you know, she said something <clears throat> about an inclusionary home. And, and I wonder whether this has been discussed because I've got three aspects of of, of housing that I really would like to flag. And I'll come to the few examples uh, from my own lessons. I think one of the big challenges South Africa has is that um, we actually do not have any inclusionary zoning legislation that basically enables um, the creation of affordable housing within the urban center. Um, and this is one very big challenge. And I've done some research about cities like Munich and Washington who have had to introduce this in order to take care of those, not only the poor, which the state takes care of, but to actually ensure that professionals, young professionals and young families can have access to housing in the city. So, so if we don't have legislation that encourages this and promotes it, we will never achieve anything. And the other one is linked to that, is that we don't have incentives for property developers to actually make affordable housing possible. Um, and this is one other big issue, which um, there are examples of this in other cities of the world. Um, and our cities don't seem to see this as their responsibility. And coming to my own lessons and things we said a few years ago, um, I, I think that um, there's still quite a long way to go in, in getting affordable housing to make financial sense for a lot of developers because the project I've just finished in, um, in, in Deep River, um, which is a, a project of the social housing entity, um, has really had a lot of challenges in terms of making it work financially and we've had to be very creative in order to make it to work. Um, starting from slashing of fees uh, because the finance first does not work to actually using very basic materials uh, because you're just not allowed more. So we, we need this debate to, to go further to say, how do we on a multi-sectoral basis develop a movement, if you like, or a broader understanding of how we can ensure a combination between legislation, which is very bureaucratic. Uh, Alfredo knows about this on the project we work together on, on the ETH and the fact that we need some incentives to be thought about. How can we make incentives, create incentives for um, social housing or affordable housing to be actually doable? I'm sorry, I'm on a building site here in the office and there's some noise, I hope you're not hearing. Um, so, so these are basically the three issues that I'd like to, to put on the table and say that as architects, we really have a challenge to create quality products uh, for affordable housing because there's just no scope for it. And, and you have to be very creative, but you also have to deal with a lot of bureaucracy 
in terms of getting some of these things through. I mean, uh, uh, the last project I'll talk about, um, which is the Filippi project in Kosovo, we, we couldn't even densify uh, there in terms of getting um, anything more than two stories built because the city's density uh, policy in the site we're building just did not allow it. And also yeah. because the funding by the state doesn't allow sectional title at that level. So, I mean, there are many things we need to do and to change in order to make this a more feasible um, kind of sector. Leander, if I have to push you for one incentive, um, we're working on a project at the moment, which I can't speak about, but it's, it's very early feasibility stage. It's quite large. Um, and for us, when we spoke to, the, to, to, let's say, the city government, the kind of incentives are quite clear from our side, what would make the project more feasible. What are one or two incentives that, that would really make some of the projects you spoke about more feasible? Uh, is it as simple as, as bulk incentives or is it down to um, maybe services or something else? I think there should be partnerships um, um, that are established because, you know, the subsidy aspect, I don't think should be just about, you know, getting the, the housing units subsidized. Um, there's a lot of public land which is owned by the state and um, which I think to be brought into the future uh, so that the land price does not form part of the developer's um, uh, financial burden, so to speak. Uh, there could be other incentives to say that we actually um, subsidize the financing uh, of this project so that, you know, you, you don't have the burden only with the, with the, with the developer only. But the state says, instead of saying I'm subsidizing 100,000 units, but I'm going to contribute a certain quantum towards um, housing that is of a certain character and criteria that need to be put together who can access it. And it shouldn't just be based on the current housing system. So there are, I mean, I'm not quite ready uh, to answer your question, but there are a number of incentives I've studied. I mean, Washington, they actually introduced a kind of a, almost like a, um, uh, a, a subsidy um, bond, which would be given to the developer so that um, whoever qualifies uh, for that bond is actually part of that process that will make the housing a bit more affordable. These are a number of things. Um, you know, I think we would need to, on a, on a partnership basis, discuss with the city, with the, with the country. At the moment, we don't even have an ear of government now for them to actually listen to the possibilities that could be there. Decisions are taken and that's it. You look at Moy, Moy, Moy Klo in Pretoria right now. It's been given to a private developer to develop 50 billion rand worth of housing. You don't know how it was procured. You don't know uh, what, what, what the criteria for it. You don't know what architecture has been applied. You don't know what urban planning strategies have been thought through or at least brought to the public. So these are the challenges we have. And I think the, the kind of partnership on a multi-sectoral basis is one of the biggest challenges we have. Thanks, Leander. Uh, we have one minute left. Um, Pete, you're, the our... man, you're the man to organize these things. You brought the topics to Leander and me years ago. Leander and I, I guess, we were able to move forward with some of the ideas. So we're actually grateful that something has come out you know, Kosovo to empower, both are great projects. And I think you, you need to lead this. We, let's do it ourselves. Let's get blocked to create a new kind of association with you at the helm, maybe somehow a board of directors. You've got Khalid, Luyanda and me uh, willing to, 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 to battle it. And I think we should try something new and, um, and challenge the city to think differently. Thanks, yeah. Alfredo. I think that's, that's a more positive note to end on, uh, is how do we go forward to the next five years, no matter where we're located, because- We'll do it, we'll do more, I'm sure. Location is a bit less relevant now. Thanks everyone, it's, it's lunch and learn, it's just one hour, and we get back to yeah. our normal lives. Um, and my apologies. I, I no, that's perfect. Discussion. It's yeah. more than perfect. Um, it's good to we'll, see you, Luyana.
everything will be recorded on the urbanfestival.co website. So you can go to the website for the program. Next week, we're looking at smarter cities, not smart cities, ways to create smarter cities and smarter approaches. Um, there's a whole bunch of programming at urbanfestival.co. Thanks to all of our guests again, wherever you are in the world. I'm in Durban right now. Thanks to my team. Uh, the recordings to all the lunch and learns and actually all the events go on the website as well as summaries. So if anybody missed it in terms of your staff, in terms of your friends, your loved ones, it's all available. And uh, I'll see you all in soon. Leanda in Cape Town, Alfredo probably New York or Oslo next year. And um, yeah, stay in touch and uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks to the comments on the chat. Um, yeah, like to thanks to Francine and Lon. Awesome as well, yeah. 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 Thanks Thank to Khalid who had to leave us a bit earlier as well. Yeah. Have a good week, everyone. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you.